Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I, uh, I'm going to do another one of these response videos. In this case, it is to a short clip uh, from an episode of Pints with Aquinas, uh, that's Matt Frad's show, um, where he's interviewing uh, Dr. Andrew Jones, uh, ostensibly at least about liberalism. Um, however, when I, when I happened across this, it struck me as a a profound misinterpretation or even a misrepresentation, uh, although that that may carry with it a connotation of uh, uh, of malice, which I don't really intend, um, but a profound misinterpretation of liberalism, uh, or at least uh, what I often will refer to uh, when I'm talking about uh, logic and logical fallacies as a kind of straw Frankenstein. So and you'll see this as as we look through and as we look at this in particular, and I'll, I'll draw our attention to the specifics of what uh, what I mean as we go forward through the video, as we watch this together and I comment on it. Um, but it seems like what Dr. Jones is doing here is constructing a target for his criticism out of bits and pieces of different incompatible uh, philosophical aspects of people who call themselves liberals and have called themselves liber liberals uh, throughout the relatively long tradition of liberalism. Um, and so in, by doing that, what he winds up doing is he creates a uh, an easy to criticize self-contradictory monstrosity uh, that he refers to as liberalism as a whole, as a system, and then condemns it. Uh, at least that's what I'm seeing here. And uh, so throughout this, keep, we'll keep an eye out for that and I'll, I'll point to it where I can. But then also uh, there are a bunch of things in here that I want to comment on as uh, as just very common um, sort of tradcon critiques of uh, of liberalism, particularly classical liberalism or libertarianism or what have you, uh, and uh, some of them are merely rhetorical, and I'll try and point those out as well. Uh, and some of them are substantial critiques, but I think dramatically miss the mark, uh, and mostly do so out of a uh, out of a misunderstanding, whether that is a deliberate or or, or misunderstanding or not. Uh, so let's uh, let's. Go. Let's check out this video, and uh, we have uh, a great place to start. Is uh, is Matt Frad's version of the Tucker Carlson face? Uh, but let's see. Um, <clears throat> again, the the original video will be linked below. Uh, so feel free to check it out. I I I have I've said this before. Uh, I've I've recommended Pints with Aquinas many many times uh, on this channel, and I will still do so. Absolutely. Um, I have not seen the rest of this interview yet. Uh, I didn't catch the full podcast episode uh, when it came out. Uh, and so I, I haven't seen the whole thing. Uh, but this section, at least, uh, like I said, has some issues. And um, and that's that's common when you have uh, when you have an, a sort of interview format. Sometimes sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's a little less than great. And so uh, so this time I, I want to see what uh, what we have to say here. And uh, let's 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 go ahead and get started, shall we? So liberalism, philosophically, is, 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 there's lots of different versions of liberalism, but the simplest way to describe it is it's the idea that, that it's anthro anthropological individualism. Okay. okay, so human beings are individuals. Yeah. All right, then society is secondary. All right, so... Okay, so that, uh, so far so good. Um, that is, it depends on what, again, it may depend on what version of liberalism you look to. Because um, if you look to, say, um, in economic theory, particularly the, the Austrian School of Economics, uh, what you have is not necessarily anthropological or metaphysical individual individualism. You have um, uh, you have methodological individualism, where the individual, the acting person, is considered as the only kind of rational agent, and that uh, and that functionally speaking, in in our mode of analysis, we reduce down group relationships into interpersonal interaction. Right? That's that's what is largely what's being referred to here. Um, however, there are also arguments to be made uh, by other liberals um, for not just methodological individualism, um, but metaphysical individualism, uh, what he calls anthropological individualism, which is an odd, um, odd bit of phrasing. And this is essentially that only the individual, in human terms, individuals exist, but that groups have no independent existence. They are not substances. They don't exist independent of uh, their constituent members. Or that the constituent members are the real things. Um, and so if you have a, a, a group of people, let's say 
uh, for instance, um, a nation, right? You have a, a nation. Uh, then that nation as such, as a nation, does not exist. What exists are the individual members and then uh, their idea of their their um, their co-nationality, if you want to call it that. Um, that is what forms this idea of the nation. And the nation, insofar as it exists, exists as a sort of um, ultimately fictional shorthand for the individuals involved to consider as a way of as a way for them to consider themselves. They consider themselves part of this nation. That is to say that they interact with these other people as a group. That's the sort of metaphysical individualism uh, that uh, that he's really talking about, just explained a little bit more uh, thoroughly and clearly. Of course, the issue here is uh, that that is a description straight out of Aristotle and Aquinas. That's roughly the Thomistic account of groups. Groups are um, what Aristotle calls secondary substances. They, don't, they do not exist on their own. They only exist derivatively of their individual members. Uh, a member of a group is the thing that, that is real. The group as such is only a, <clears throat> uh, sort, of, a sort of shorthand for the, uh, for the way that the individual members uh, interact with each other. So to say that we are part of a nation, we are co-nationalists, uh, is to say that we relate to one another and others relate to us in light of this, uh, this, sort, of, this sort of shared idea of nationhood. That, that's, that's all that means, right? Um, the, the best Thomistic analogy, I would say, uh, is that secondary substances or groups um, are more like artifacts than like substances on the Thomistic view. Uh, so for Aquinas, artifacts, things uh, like, you know, like my water bottle here, uh, th this does not exist per se. It doesn't exist in and of itself. This is an artifact that is made by human beings. The substantial form here is, say, the the, the water inside and the 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 Plastic is even a hard case because it's completely synthetic. So I guess the petroleum involved or something like that. Um, and so that is actually what exists. The, the bottle itself, it only exists because we impart meaning to its constituent elements and their artificially imposed form that we impose on it. And the same would apply to secondary substances qua groups. And groups of individuals, uh, things like nations, um, or whatever else, any other group as well, uh, only exists insofar as we attribute that meaning to it as individuals. That again, that is just the that's the Thomistic position just as much as it is the liberal position. So so far, what he's got is not a particularly controversial view or even a uniquely liberal view. This is just the this is the Western tradition uh, of of individualism, I suppose, but thinking of individuals as the primary substance. Uh, primary substances, metaphysically speaking. Um, now, of course, there is one exception for Aquinas and for any Catholic, really, and that is the church. Uh, the church, as a secondary substance, it does actually exist. It has its own its own metaphysical being, independent of its constituent members. And that's but that's because it is the mystical body of Christ. Mystical meaning it is the direct uh, creation of God. And so like any other direct creation of God, so natural beings, substances, uh, it has its own substantial form. So, okay, the, the one exception <laughs> to anthropological individualism, if you want to, again, if you want to use the term, uh, the only exception to that would be the church, which, fine, okay, cool. Anyway, so, not a problem, what are you saying here, so far? So far, so fine, although it's not characteristic of individualism, or not characteristic of liberalism per se. Um, but he's going to try and make this into a problem. So let's keep going. So the individual exists first, then the society um, flows out of that. Um, it is the idea that uh, that hmm. normally it rests on the idea that that human relations are um, contractual or violent. So they're like the, the famous um, the famous articulation of this in the Austrian school of liberals is that. Did you catch that? So they're like the, the famous um, the famous articulation of this in the Austrian school. The Austrian school. Okay, great. <clears throat> so the Austrian school of economics is a uh, is a 
school of economic thought per se. Uh, it is a it is a an approach to uh, economic science, which is entirely value free, uh, which finds which finds its basis in explicitly explicitly either Kantian or Thomistic metaphysics, because there is a split in the Austrian school between the Misesians and the Rothbardians. So the Misesians take a Kantian uh, metaphysic and the Rothbardians take a Thomistic metaphysic of personhood um, and of human interaction and human rationality and all of that. And so again, there's a lot more nuance here that, than there than is presented, first of all. But then he goes, Love liberals is. So he's, again, here referring to the Austrian school of economics as a school of liberalism. Okay. This raise some red flags for me. Um, I have found in a lot of cases that um, that very traditionalist minded conservative types, uh, particularly the sort of anti free market conservatives, which are a rare, rare breed, but tend to be sort of Catholic distributists or something like that, um, which I don't know. I don't know. Dr. Jones' actual political views. Uh, I don't know if he holds, or economic views, I, guess, I should say. I don't know if he holds to uh, something like Chestertonian or Bellocchian distributism. Neither here nor there. Um, but he does seem to make this error, which is very common among, um, among some traditionally minded Catholics, which is to reduce economics, the science of economics, to a political ideology. And so to treat economic science as if it were merely politics, and in this case, certainly, and in a lot of cases, similarly, to simply dismiss it as, well, that's just an ideology, which is modernist, liberal, antithetical to the church. And the problem here, of course, is that it's treating a school of thought, a, not a school of thought, a um, mode of analyzing the human aspects of the world, the mode of analyzing human society and human interactions, um, a, as if it were a simple, simply an ideology as opposed to another, rather than simply something that we can analyze about the world. And it's a kind of dismissal of economic science. And you find this tragically commonly um, among a lot of, uh, even a lot of, sort of conservatives on the right, um, mostly among relatively traditionalist Catholics, and I've seen it among Orthodox, but it's honestly more common among Catholics, unfortunately, uh, among us. So th this is uh, this is to my shame that this happens. Um, because again, I think that, that the Austrian school is, is, is very much just the metaphysical Thomism applied to, uh, to the science of economics. That's what, that's what, Austrian economics is, especially the sort of Rothbardian strain of uh, Austrian economics. So, um, so let's back up a moment and let's see exactly what he says about this, and let's uh, let's pick apart this this uh, this um, this voluntary involuntary or this uh, this um, this dichotomy between the ways people can interact. Well, individualism. Okay. okay, so human beings are individuals. That um, it is okay, the idea that uh, that hmm. normally it rests on the idea that that human relations are. Um, contractual or violent, so they're like the, the famous um, the famous articulation of this in the Austrian school of liberals is that human relations are either contractual or hegemonic, and there's no there's no third way. What does that word mean? I've heard it, but I don't know what it means. Master slave, hegemonic. One person is dominating the other. Okay. Or it's contractual. Okay. Those are your okay. Um, so this is uh, again so far relatively straightforward. This is uh, this simply means that if something is he says contractual, voluntary is again the typically the preferred term, terminology here. Um, there are places, if I'm not mistaken, where Mises says contractual. Uh, Ludwig, von, Ludwig von Mises, the sort of founder of the Austrian School of, of Economics, again not of it, not of liberalism. Um, but this is certainly this this dichotomy doesn't really trace its way back any further than sort of the marginal the marginal revolution in economics which is the sort of late 19th century um this does not find its way all the way back to the roots of liberalism this is not what Locke or Hobbes thought at all uh not even slightly 
Uh, this is a relatively modern, and by which I mean the last 150 years or so, even even compared to the rest of the sort of liberal tradition. Uh, this dichotomy of uh, of contractual versus hegemonic, or uh, or maybe we could we'd better we'd be better to say um, voluntary versus coercive. Uh, that this is a relatively new distinction. Uh, this is a new realization that that any human interaction must be one of these two things. Uh, which, but then again, I think that this is, I mean, this is kind of obviously true. Right? Either you are employing coercion or you are not. That is the that's that's the law of non-contradiction. Um, applying it to the the particular case, right? So so something is either voluntary or involuntary. You you consent or you do not. Force needs to be employed or it does not. That's it. Um, the, uh, the, the distinction by um, uh, Oppenheimer is uh, the, the dichotomy between the two means or methods we have of, uh, of getting people to, to agree to something. Uh, and those are the political means and the economic means. The political means is through violence, force, and coercion. You can, you can threaten, coerce, or cajole somebody into agreeing with you. Or the economic means, which is that you can convince someone. You can come to an agreement uh, mutually, voluntarily. Right? And yeah, that's that's it. That is really the only ways of uh, of that human interactions can go. Simply because these are mutually exhaustive categories. Now, when he says contractual here, he uses that term very deliberately based on how he's going to go on to, to explain this dichotomy. Because he sets up contractual as contrasted with natural social relationships and that is uh that is again simply relying on this particular bit of terminology and then sort of reading that back into earlier thinkers so keep this in mind again that that this dichotomy between the what, what we can call contractual if we want uh, but the contractual and the, the hegemonic or what we'd probably better better say the voluntary and the coercive that this dichotomy is a strict, uh, mutually exhaustive set of categories for human interaction. So again, we have these two assumptions that he's laying out, methodological, or maybe we can say metaphysical individualism. Um, metaphysical individualism, by the way, goes a, lot, goes a lot further than methodological individualism, but again, that's just rooted in Thomism. So that, goes, that has roots way further back than, um, than liberalism. And the other sort of assumption is this dichotomy of uh, of ways of uh, modes of social interaction between the voluntary and the coercive, and that is much newer than liberalism. There are only certain groups of modern liberals, um, even liberals broadly speaking here, that hold to that. So his two core assumptions that he he says define liberalism: one vastly predates liberalism, and one postdates liberalism. So that's already a problem. But let's continue and see where he goes from here. Your options. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's, yeah. so it presupposes, um, yeah, so, so those are your options. Um, it normally views then social order as being uh, one of these contractual arrangements. Because of that, the purpose of social order is the maximal, the maximization of the individual's ability to realize his own ends, whatever they may be. To that is Okay. <clears throat> whatever they may be here is, uh, that is... The purpose of the social order, he's not careful as to what he defines as the social order. I think he just means society in general. The, the, the coming together of human beings and whatever social arrangements we might have. Um, he thinks of this as contractual. Now, that's a jump because we already said that humans can arrange themselves socially in two ways. Contractually or hegemonically. Um, or, say, voluntarily versus coercively. So that isn't to say that human beings when we arrange ourselves socially, only do so contractually. We think of we think of uh, we think of society as a social contract. Well, yes, I will say that is first of all that is a, a liberal idea. That's that's sort of John Locke certainly. Although again, you find this much earlier than Locke. You find versions of this in a lot of the Church Fathers. You find versions of the a version of this in Plato. This goes very far back into the Western tradition beyond liberalism per se, but 
let's assume for now that this sort of social contractarianism is a trait of liberalism per se. Okay, it's... That ignores the other possibility. Rather than saying that, rather than saying that society is necessarily contractual, the liberal will say that society, social relationships between people, ought to only be contractual, ought to only be voluntary. Now, that is, of course, the, the consistent libertarian position of anarcho-capitalism, broadly speaking, or at least some form of anarchism, which is the consistently applied liberal, liberal perspective. But the fact that... The fact that he takes this to be a descriptive uh, explanation of social organization rather than a proscriptive uh, norm for social organization, it, again, it shows either a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of liberalism. So let's take it back a little bit. Let's let's hear this part again, uh, and then we'll move on forward and see where we stop. So, so those are your options. Um, it normally views then social order as being uh, one of these contractual arrangements. Because of that... The purpose of social order is the maximal the maximization of the individual's ability to realize his own ends, whatever they may be. So that is exactly what Dave Rubin talked about constantly. <laughs> okay, so whatever they happen to be, the individual, individual, or the individual. You like one yeah. thing, I like a different thing. Someone okay, so we're talking here about the about different ends that we might have. Once again, this is just really straightforward, um, Thomistic, uh moral psychology. The, the fact that we have ends necessarily means that we take them to be good. We, we, we understand them as good. And if we understand them as good, there must be something good about them. And we can be mistaken about that. Right? We can be mistaken about thinking that the end that we are pursuing is in fact the highest good or the, the good most worth pursuing. However, in order for a human being to pursue an end at all, it has to be good to some degree. Now, we could be pursuing some better, some higher good, or some lesser good when we should be pursuing a higher good. That's what it means to do something wrong, to do something unethical. To pursue uh, an end at all is to assume that it is a good end. And probably, if not the best end, it is preferable to the alternatives. Uh, preferable to the, to the available alternatives. Now, um, the, 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 the liberal claim goes beyond this, beyond just saying that the, 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 that we should maximize, we should maximize the individual's ability to obtain whatever end they see fit because there's also an epistemological claim involved. Uh, liberalism of, of whatever variety, uh, holds that for whatever various reason, because there's all sorts of reasons for this, uh, by different liberals. It holds that the individual knows best, or at least is in the best position to know what ends are are best to be pursued by them. Okay, so uh, whether you get this in sort of the 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 the, the very sort of primitive liberal Hobbesian Lockean kind of that strain of thought, where the idea is that. Um, whatever the individual pursues as an end is uh, constitutive of their end, uh, that, which, which, which kind of gets, uh, finds its sort of apotheosis in the, the sort of um, the existentialist and that sort of thing. Uh, or if you have the more, um, the, the more, I guess, modern libertarian view that uh, it isn't that everyone has distinct from libertine, but the modern libertarian view, which is that everyone has their own distinct ends and that I am in a better position to know what is best for me than you are because I know more about my life than, than you do, right? If, if, I, if I pursue something as an end, say, making this video right now, uh, but you think that I should be doing something else, uh, well, you could be right, but it's far more likely that I'm right, given that I know how my life is set up right now. And you probably, you as a random viewer, probably don't, right? Even if you know me rather well, the the reason that the liberal would say that I ought to have, I ought to necessarily have the final say as to what my ends are and what my ends ought to be, is that it is to defer to the person who's in the best 
the best place to know. It is a kind of um, uh, a kind of epistemological humility. Right? So th there's that additional factor that isn't being considered here. Uh, no, fair point. This that uh, I mean, fair point on the Dave Rubin thing that that uh, that this that the 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 flourishing of the individual understood as the individual being able to pursue their own ends, whatever those ends are. Uh, that is kind of the, the go-to talking point for for uh, sort of right-wing liberals, uh, the mostly the sort of free market liberals, but even even beyond that. Um, you, you find this in the sort of postmodern um, strain of thought where where we def we don't just select our ends, we define our own ends. And that defines what we are and that defines our sort of essence, the, the more existentialist strain. Uh, that, that even sounds relatively similar to this. But there's a stark difference between these different reasons. And again, he's sort of blending these two together as a way of criticizing liberalism per se, despite there being really substantial differences in the different ways in which he's the ways in which what he's saying could mean right so so if we look at uh if we look at the this uh this idea of of maximization of the individual's ability to achieve their ends the liberal argument is that that is probably the best way of achieving the, the common good Right? In other words, the, 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 the good for as many people as we possibly can allow to flourish. That people, when, when, um, when allowed to pursue their ends, are, are best capable of, a, of obtaining the objectively good ends, uh, rather than being interfered with. Uh, that, is a, that is a separate, that is a political claim. But, and it's one, by the way, it is one that we can criticize, right? That is, that is open to criticism. Because people don't necessarily make good decisions. But it's not one that he criticizes here, really, except implicitly. It's really just one that he and Matt just go, oh, man, that sounds bad because you know how people are. But but again, that that, it, that doesn't constitute anything like uh, a criticism, at least here. Now, he goes on to criticize other aspects more explicitly. But this is where the weakness is if you're going to find it, right? If you're going to find a crack in the armor of liberalism, here you go. You got it. It's right here. It's the difference between real and perceived goods that's it all right so but anyway all right um okay uh now i will add here too that uh that most thomists i know have find the concept of the common good to be relatively uh almost vacuous because it's just so vague um and that if we take it in its most modest, in the most modest way, that the common good is the baseline conditions for uh, human flourishing within a given society, then I do think that the liberal assumption is absolutely spot on. That 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 people need to be not interfered with so that they can be allowed to flourish. It is a baseline provision for social order and stability, such that people can uh, people can choose to flourish. If they choose to flourish. Now, maybe combine that with things like a good moral education, but again, do that without contradicting the first thing, because that first thing has to be the baseline. And so that's where you get the sort of most intellectually consistent version of liberalism, the sort of anarcho capitalist. Um, the state is innately coercive, and that means it's innately contrary to the common good, that, that sort of reasoning. Okay. Someone else likes another thing, and the social, the purpose of society is to maximize our abilities to pursue yeah. those ends. And then the only morality is don't step on anyone's toes as you seek those ends. Right. But we can't explain why you shouldn't, but just don't. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, again, this does this, okay. I've said this a lot before, uh, but there is a, there's a sort of parallelism between two, um, two kinds of political errors. Uh, on the one hand, you have the uh, the libertine who says what he just said that that the only thing that is right or wrong is not is uh, is violence or coercion, right? Nothing can be wrong if you're not interfering with or harming someone else. On the other hand, you have the 
what I usually refer to as Puritans. The people who think that that there's lots of things that oh okay wait how do I put this that both of these both of these errors the libertine and the puritan the puritan who who like this thinks that there's all sorts of things that are wrong and that we ought to socially speaking stop them we ought to apply coercive means to stop them there we go they both make the same error and that is to assume that all moral norms are justly enforceable okay that is a huge error okay so there are plenty of things that are wrong that one ought not to do but that it would be wrong for me to try and stop them from doing it so if i think um things simple relatively straightforward um it is, let's say, uh, something relatively plausible, but that it's unethical to, to do something which will cause undue harm onto your person. Let's say gluttony. There we go. Good example. That it's wrong to overindulge in food and drink. I think we probably can all agree with that, because it's true. And now where the line is... Eh, it's just difficult to discern the line may differ from person to person because again the the general moral principle of of uh, we ought to be moderate in our intake of food and drink um that can largely depend on uh, on our own station in life that can depend on our own dietary needs our own uh, our activity level all that sort of thing right um health requirements etc but if we can tailor in that line if we find where that line is particularly precisely that it's certainly true that overindulging in food and drink is wrong however if i see somebody overindulging and i can be morally certain that they are overindulging it would be unjust of me to slap the burger out of their hand right that me employing in me employing force to stop someone from doing something unethical is not necessarily acceptable. It's not necessarily moral. That gap between the just and the enforceable, or between justice and morality, if you want morality more broadly, if you want to think of it that way, uh, those moral norms which are justly enforceable and those moral norms which are, which are not justly enforceable uh, by coercive means, that gap gets eliminated by both the libertine who thinks that Everything wrong should be violently stopped because the only things that are wrong are those things which are, are directly um, directly harmful to another person that are aggressive. Or the more Puritan type who would hold that everything wrong ought to be stopped, at least if it's practical to do so. But that means that all of the various things that are wrong should have force employed to stop them. These are the exact same error. They just... They just, they're just, their, their scope differs, right? And so here, here we have this problem just blatantly demonstrated. It's not that the only moral norms are do no harm. That's obviously false. You, you will find, you won't even find many liberals who hold that. You certainly will find almost no, um, well, not almost no, but. You'll find very few sort of consistent liberals, as I say, like anarchists, who say something like that. And the ones you do, the rest of us kind of laugh at because they're a little bit cringe. You know, the, the libertines, the kind of just leave me alone, you're not my dad types. That they're we we all kind of acknowledge that they're 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 a little bit silly, right? That we all acknowledge that there are moral norms aside from, say, the non-aggression principle. But those moral norms are not justly enforceable. That's the difference. That it's inappropriate to employ violent means to enforce moral norms that aren't that do not involve aggression against person or property. Okay, that that's the key difference here, right? That's it, right? Because he's making a lot out of this, uh, out of this. The this idea that the only moral norms are those which are are put forward by, uh, say. 
he doesn't say it, but the non-aggression principle. Which, by the way, worth noting as well, that is a very small sector of liberalism as a broad ideology holds to this idea. Uh, there are plenty of liberal ideologies that hold to that hold to to much broader conceptions of uh, of, of ethics, or even of of justice, of enforceable morality. So again, he's this is that cobbling together of an idea to criticize from a bunch of different micro viewpoints. Okay. Uh, now, they also said one last thing here, and I want to I want to get a little lead into this next discussion. So morality is don't step on anyone's toes as you seek those ends okay. right but we can't explain why you shouldn't but just don't yeah you really okay you can't explain why you shouldn't again this is assuming that the liberal the liberal project is is sort of metaphysically barren this is assuming um that there is no uh no metaphysical basis for any of these claims which as i've i've talked about this before that that most of the the liberal project is it finds its roots in uh in more ancient uh metaphysical claims some don't. Some are. Um, there are liberal metaphysicians who do their own, their own sort of modern metaphysics that are that are incorrect. Fine, fair enough. And that can't uh, that can't base moral norms properly. Can't do it well. Um, but, but like I said, the whole Rothbardian tradition within the 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 within the sort of Austrian economics school within uh, within of, of liberalism, um, basically finds its entire basis in in Thomism, Thomistic metaphysics. So again, that's there's nothing again there's nothing incompatible there. Is the point? Uh, there isn't. It isn't to say that there is no, there is no or can be no reason for these moral norms because there certainly is, right? So. Whether that is uh, something to do with our, uh, our uh, sort of theological anthropology, you know, a, a Thomistic school of thought, stuff that I've talked about plenty of times before, so I don't, want, I won't reiterate too much here. Um, link below to my ethics playlist, and in particular the one where I talk about the sort of Thomistic basis for Rothbard's thought. Um, look at that. Beyond this, right? Beyond this, um, there's also other approaches. There's a, there's like I said, there's a more Kantian approach as well. Uh, even to the, the sort of anarcho-capitalist um, uh, Misesian tradition, which takes uh, which takes a, a universalizability of norms to be foundational, right? And this is uh, this is probably best articulated by um, by uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, his argumentation ethics, that sort of thing. Which I do think that there are holes with that. There are problems there, and it has to do with his metaphysical anthropology, uh, because he's not a Thomist really. Um, but again, if you're going to take, uh, if you're going to take the, the the sort of modernist conception of human beings, then yeah, he's got a really solid basis. Right? Hoppe has a really solid basis for why it is necessarily unjust to uh, to uh, aggress upon somebody else. Short, very short version, which is like tragically short. I'll I'll link something better in the description as well. But um, the the tragically short version is that um, that by acting, we are necessarily using means available to us, uh, and by using those means available to us, we are assuming that those means are um, are excludable to us and not to others. Right. So we we form a sort of a basis for property norms, and then. When we uh, when we uh, seek to resolve disputes with one another, if we are to have a discussion about how a dispute ought to be resolved, if we're to employ rational means, that assumes, by the fact that we are employing rational means, that rational means are the appropriate way to allocate resources, and so that excludes by default the political means. So it is impossible, it's self-referentially incoherent to argue for the use of the political means for organizing society. Right? There's the very short version. I'm leaving a lot out. There's holes in that version of the argument. So don't don't at me. But that's the very basic version. But again, there is a solid, there's a bunch of different ways of having a really solid basis for these ideas. Really can't. <laughs> All right. So so there's there's it's just an agreement. It's a contract it's an agreement. Come up with. Yeah, it's an like, agreement. I don't want my desires. Right. Usurped. You don't want yours, so let's agree not to do that to each right, other. But why would you keep but the, the agreement? agreement's arbitrary? Why would you keep the agreement? And what?
why would you keep the agreement? Because it's wrong not to. Again, it's based in ethics. This is this is this is uh, to borrow a phrase from C.S. Lewis um, from the Abolition of Man. This is holding a gun to the head of the Tao. This is just this is just trying to question why why I ought to be moral, why I ought to do the good. Now, if what he means by this, what he's trying to do here is trying to trying to say that that liberalism has no meta ethics, then like I just said, that's that's nonsense. Um, but it's but it's plausible nonsense at least. Now, if if what he's trying to do is that this is say that this principle itself is non justified, is unjustified, and doesn't self justify it anyway, then that's that's a that's an even stronger claim. And why? I mean, again, as as broadly speaking, I think we're all Thomists here, more or less. I mean, I'm a more of an Anselmian, but still, I'm a scholastic. Everyone calls me a Thomist. Let's go with that. Um, because of this, I, I think we can all agree that 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 uh, doing the good, doing the the right thing, is in fact justified. That there is a reason to do the right thing. And that, that that doesn't require an enforcement mechanism to say that something ought to be done. Anyway, uh, this is where he goes. This is where he goes off the rails. So here we go. Well, this, is a, this is the question Hobbes tackles. It's like he's like, well, why would you keep the agreement? Right. Well, the only reason why you would is because the consequences of breaking it outweigh yeah. you outweigh whatever gains you hope by 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 keep you know by breaking yes. it. So that means that that the social the enforcement mechanism has to be ubiquitous. The enforce has to be the enforcement system has to be ubiquitous. Right. Okay. So again, he's talking about social contract theory here, which which tracing that back to Hobbes, fair enough. Um, I think that that most modern liberals would not include Hobbes in uh, as the sort of basis for their for their tradition, but okay. Um, Hobbes was fairly anti-liberal, uh, at least in modern terms, just given given the idea that um, of the, the sort of absolutist state, which is contrary to uh, to the. Hobbes is seen as, I think correctly, the foil to Locke, to John Locke. That they 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 encountered the problems of early modernity and the political problems. Um, and then they they reacted to them in op in opposite ways, rather than them just being buddy buddy parts of the same tradition. Um, that's attributing uh, attributing the, the sort of Hobbesian idea of uh, of the social contract cum Leviathan uh, it, and the, the sovereignty of the, the absolute sovereignty of the state the liberalism per se this way is is historically off base if nothing else but certainly um, certainly unnecessary because again it does not require the 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 it doesn't uh, agreeing not to harm each other does not it doesn't need to be reduced simply down to I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't, right? Um, this is this is uh, another example of this is uh, something else that I've I've been talking about recently again in class is uh, is um, the the character of Glaucon in Plato's Republic basically lays out kind of a social contract theory about basically this saying that it would be nice if we could commit injustice but we can't get away with it and so um, we agree not to commit injustice to each other and that's where justice comes from. Right? That's that's just He's just sort of, sort of retelling that idea here, um, and then slapping the label of liberal on it, which again I don't think is. I think it's a bit disingenuous. If every human interaction is contractual, yeah, and the only reason why people keep contracts is they're afraid of the consequences of breaking it, yeah. Again, that's massively question begging. Then every human interaction has three parties: the two people engaged in it, and the enforcement mechanism, the state. Non sequitur. Two non sequiturs, actually. Um, it does not necessarily have three parties engaged. Engaged. Um, if the probably no, it probably does. There are probably three parties involved. There's probably an enforcement mechanism in any kind of any kind of formal contractual relationship, but not necessarily. Right? Not necessarily. Um, if by contractual we mean what what the what the the Austrian school means or what uh, what liberalism means. Uh, if, in other words, if we just mean voluntary, then I have voluntary relationships with other people all the time, and there is no enforcement mechanism. Right? I, um, for example, um, right? My uh, my neighbor asked me to mow, my, mow his lawn. 
while he's away on vacation. I say, sure, why not? I'll, I'll take care of it for you. No worries. What if I don't? What happens? Nothing, right? Like, it's not like, it's not like he's going to sue me. Not even like he's going to be like all that upset. I mean, I could, if, if there's a good reason I have, like, like, uh, I'm sorry, my lawnmower broke down or something. I haven't been able to get it fixed. I'll, uh, don't worry, I'll, 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 I'll get back to you on it. Right? Or something, right? If I come up with a reason for it, or if there is a reason for it, or whatever. Or even if there isn't a reason. Oh, man, I'm sorry, I forgot. Probably how that's going to go is, all right, no worries, man, I'll take care of it. That's how it'll work, right? Be because there is no enforcement mechanism. There's no fear of consequence. Now, it's, now, it could be that the consequence is simply between the two people as well. Right? The, the fear of enforcement is... If, you know, my neighbor gets back from vacation and I've been just laying on my ass and not mowing his lawn this whole time. And he says, hey, uh, hey, I thought you were going to mow my lawn. Oh, man, I didn't feel like it. And then he'll start seeing me as lazy, as unreliable, as all these bad things. And I don't want that. That has nothing to do with a third party enforcement mechanism. That has to do with our perceptions of each other as individuals in a relationship with, with one another. Right? Voluntary relationships do not necessarily need any kind of third-party enforcement mechanism. Now, they can. They can have a third-party enforcement mechanism. And this is where we get to the next non sequitur. It doesn't have to be the state. Okay? And this is one of the key insights of the... Um, what? The... The, the anarcho-capitalists in general, but... Uh, but more the, uh, oh shoot, what's his name? Um, I cannot remember what the, um, the, I'll put it, I'll write it down somewhere when I think of it <laughs> in the editing room. Um, but I know also, I, I'll say that, uh, that, um, an economist like Bob Murphy lays out how law enforcement can work absent state intervention, right? Contractual enforcement can happen by third parties without those third parties having having sort of hegemonic domination over the whole of society, having sovereignty, right? Even just put this on an interpersonal level, right? If, if I agree with somebody else to do something and I say, hey, let's pick this other person to, to sort of hold us accountable and, and figure out if I'm actually fulfilling my duties or not, that doesn't need to be the state. Right. Again, this this leap from there needs to be an enforcement mechanism to there needs to be one single enforcement mechanism for all of society is absurd. Now, it's really common. It's a really common mistake. And fine, there are liberal there are a lot there are a lot of sort of classical night watchman state liberals that make this assumption. But there's no reason to make this assumption. It is a non sequitur. It is a leap in logic from there needs to be an enforcement mechanism to there needs to be one enforcement mechanism. So, okay, moving on. Okay, right, so you're, the future yeah, you have a ubiquitous though. state, and, and, and someone like John Locke, I think a big brother, a big explicitly big... says this, I mean, and, and that the state, that the only way it works is for everybody, everybody who enters into the compact to surrender all that they have, all their rights, all their property, all that they have to the state, and then the state grants it back to them. And now the state owns everything. Right, that's... Yeah, so that's a, problem right that is a critique and if i'm not mistaken in Locke, in Locke, that might even be a critique of a sort of hobbesian model i could be wrong there i don't know this i don't know what he's referring to in Locke. um but certainly i would call that a critique of the state i would call that a critique of there being a sole enforcement mechanism for all human all human social interactions there needn't be Primarily because there needn't be an enforcement mechanism for a lot of social interactions. And the ones that do need an enforcement mechanism can be polycentric. Right? There, there needn't be one singular institution that, that handles everything throughout society. That's, that's absurd. Um, and again, that, that the fact that it means that we, it, it, it looks like at least that it means we are sort of uh, giving everything up to the state so that the state can come back and protect us from each other and from itself somehow. Um, yeah, that's, that's absurdly self-contradictory, but again, that's what happens when you construct a straw Frankenstein like this. That's the way, <laughs> and so we can manage and control everything. Is that what we mean by socialism and communism? Well, no, that's a whole different, this is liberalism. This is liberalism. Yeah, right, so, help me understand so, that. So,
So this is the this is the this is that that little bit of a connection there. That you're right. This is not socialism. This is not communism per se. Um, but socialism and communism do arise from this same tradition. They're they're offshoots of this same tradition, and they are the more totalitarian branches of that tradition, um, which. It, This, this has been a huge, huge debate lately. And uh, funny enough, it's what got me among thousands of other people blocked by James Lindsay on Twitter. Um, th the argument that, uh, that yes, uh, that communism, Marxism, uh, is, uh, is ultimately part of the liberal tradition, but it's an aberrant part. It's one of the many aberrations of liberalism. And again, because the liberal tradition is really broad, it's really, it's really almost undefinable because it's so diverse at this point because it's branched off in so many ways uh yeah you can find wacky contradictions in it and yeah you can find really bad ideas in it like like you're saying here liberalism the liberalism seeks to okay so if, if we're going to take liberalism as an ideology and say it's sincere yeah okay which is a stretch but let's just it's a little bit uncharitable but maybe he means what i just meant so let's be charitable to him and assume that he means that liberalism as an ideology just is is this collection of a whole bunch of different ideas rather than just being one idea and so so it's hard to say that it is an ideology that it is a genuine idea so maybe let's go with that i i hope that's what he means he doesn't clarify but let's let's just hope that's it assume it's sincere so what you're trying to do is maximize human autonomy yeah right you're trying to maximize the individual's <clears throat> autonomy so what you're trying to do is so, so here's the problem if you're a liberal you're trying to okay maximizing human autonomy is a little bit it's not quite how i'd put it rather that that liberalism broadly speaking assumes that the human individual is autonomous and that that external that that um coercive means employed against that autonomy are therefore unjustified right that it, it's it's about individual sovereignty that the individual is sovereign over that i am sovereign over oneself that i own myself and that someone else claiming ownership over me is a form of imposition, it is a form of theft, it is a form of injustice, it is a form of hegemony, right? As the term you used before. To maximize individual autonomy, you, you, your anthropology it dictates to you that human beings are by nature independent rational actors, mm -hmm. right? So we are making decisions about our own self-interest independently of everyone else, other than to the extent they impinge upon that self-interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the anthropology. And yet when you look around, what do you actually see? It's like, well, actually what I see are moral codes, gender norms, uh, family structures, religious dogmas. I see customary law that's governing. I see all kinds of things in society that seem to be um, limiting the scope for autonomous rational action. No. Okay, again, he's missing the, the crucial distinction here, which is between, uh, between coercive and voluntary means. Having social constraints on one's actions are is radically different from having legal or threatened constraints on one's actions right the fact that i put it this way i could go to class uh dressed like i am right now uh wearing a wearing a collared shirt with uh, with with no bow tie wearing i'm wearing shorts as it happens um, I could go teach like this. No one would tell me not to do that. No one would fire me. No one would, would, if I just came into school and taught, taught wearing shorts, uh, maybe some sandals. It is Florida after all, but still that's unprofessional. It's not socially acceptable. It's, it's not the right thing to do. It would be inappropriate of me to do so. No one is going to stop me, right? The fact that society, right, social rules, social pressure, um, manners, etc., tell me that I ought to behave in a certain way, in other words, that there are moral norms, does not infringe upon my autonomy, right? I can still flaunt those rules if I choose to. And nothing will stop me from doing so. And it would be wrong, in fact, to stop me from doing so, at least under most circumstances. Right? Unless I've, again, agreed not to do something. If I've contractually, 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 not just voluntarily agreed. If I've con contracted to do something a certain way and I fail to do it, that's different. But 
the fact that I say act in a way that is, you know, socially inappropriate, that's not that's not sort of an enforceable infraction. And because it's not an enforceable infraction, it's not enforced. And because it is not enforced, it is not an imposition upon my autonomy. Right? Autonomy here. I think what he's what he's taking this to mean here is that he is taking maybe the root, the, the root meaning of the words. Autonomos, right? That I am a law unto myself. Right? That that the only rules that I want to obey come entirely from me. And that is that's alien to the liberal tradition. And in fact, it's 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 antithetical to a lot of elements within the liberal tradition that holds that there must be uh, social norms and rules and even sort of mediating institutions that he's going to start decrying soon. Um, but these these various institutions that are not the state, that do not have coercive power, um, that we that we find ourselves within and in relationship with and even obeying and working with because we choose to, because we acknowledge that we ought to. I ought to, say, put on a bow tie when I go teach. I ought to have certain professional standards. I ought to do all of the various things that I that I do, but I don't but I'm not compelled to. Right, I see all kinds of thing of forces, not just states or anything that are impinging upon that individual or the realization of that anthropology, right? The the the, the coming to fruition of that idea of the individual <laughs> rational actor who's charged. Hold on. So he's, ah, okay. He's mixing, I see what he's doing. He's mixing anthropologies here. He's mixing the, the liberal anthropology, which is pretty shallow because it, it can come from all, or so all sorts of different, uh, it can have all sorts of different baseline assumptions. But he's assuming a, a, I would probably say a strictly existentialist anthropology. The idea that the human being is, is entirely self-creating. Right? That we are we are entirely self determining. That there is that that my my existence precedes my essence. I create my own essence, so to speak. Um, and if he's assuming that that is fundamental to liberalism, fine, that's wrong. So I guess we're in agreement. But that's not not typical of liberalism, certainly. Hurting his own course through life, right? Okay. So the original foundation of the state is that is to get together in order to reduce the impact of any other authority huh. or power structure on the autonomy of the individual. Okay. Okay. So the state is a, is a agreement that's designed to say, well, if you're bare minimum kind of lock in, um, at least we'll stop crime. Like other strong people from taking your stuff. Yeah. Okay. Those are two radically different claims. He's going to get worse on the first part. So keep that in mind. We're going to, we're going to examine that part first, but the, the lock in idea of this sort of night watchman state, um, there are lots of arguments by, by more, more, uh, more consistent liberals, by sort of anarchists, anarcho-capitalists especially, that that is that does that necessarily means um, that that that's necess it's necessarily self-contradictory. It's necessarily that if we are going to have a minimalist state, a state which has the powers of a state but but only uses them to prevent crime, it can only do so by criminal means. Uh, in other words, by infringing upon the autonomy of uh, the autonomy of individuals, not simply to resolve disputes, but by by things like taxation, by things like preventing competing uh, dispute resolution uh, forms of dispute resolution, uh, just stopping competitors, that sort of thing, um, imp imposition of monopoly, etc. Okay. And so the Lockean minarchist state is self contradictory in this way. Right. So he has a solid criticism here. He's not quite articulating it as he probably ought to. But that's also not that's also not his point. Right? His point is that the state he thinks that the state not only can and will, which it will, but ought to. Right? The whole point of the state on the liberal view is to eliminate mediating institutions, which in other words, institutions which compete with itself for imposition on the individual. That is the nightmare scenario for almost any liberal, that the state is the totalizing force of all society. That's, that's not the, the, not even the, the, that's not even the Lockean idea 
which is that there are mediating institutions, but they are subservient to and cooperate with the state, which is still, again, huge, a huge problem. Um, but he's even saying that these, these mediating, mediating institutions must be restrained from imposing upon individuals, imposing in the, in a strictly nonviolent, non-coercive voluntary way. Again, this is, this is, this is where he gets to utter insanity. Okay. External and internal threats. Yes. That's so we'll, 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 we'll stop that from happening, from people taking your stuff from you. All right. That's just the beginning. But why stop there? Right. Like if the purpose of the state is to maximize um, individual economy, yep. then anywhere where you see. Hold on. Yeah. Again, the purpose of the state maximizing individual autonomy, that's exactly where we get to blatant self-contradiction because the state by its very nature is coercive. It is by its very nature an imposition upon individual autonomy. So, so throw that out, but let's go on individual autonomy being compromised is a, a place for potential expansion hmm. of the state you see so so um uh family structures say are oppressive <laughs> family structures are oppressive so um they they they, they are um they are convinced this is you take someone like john stuart mill or someone like that from the 19th century where you you're, you're 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 looking at society no longer merely as physical coercion but you're looking at society and understanding how cultural coercion works how pressure works how shame works how um that uh, uh peer Ad pressure advertising yeah all this sort of stuff is there and it's all affecting that realization of the autonomy of the individual okay um so again if by autonomy of the individual we mean this absolute self-creation then i mean Yes, I suppose then any form of norms is going uh, are going to present some kind of constraint. Um, but if we are sane instead of that, um, then uh, then no, there, there there is no contradiction in the in the sort of broad liberal project uh, between having uh, having other not other having institutions that that convey and conform and confer norms and having just objective norms upon human behavior. Uh, with 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 wanting, but with having as a political goal, let's say, uh, the elimination of coercion, uh, that there being no legal means of uh, the the no legal means to initiate violence against another person. There we go. That's that's again. That's just basically the definition of anarcho capitalism. Right? That there is no legal means. Uh, a, an, anarcho, an anarcho capitalist society is one in which there is no legal means of initiating violence against another person or property. There we go. So in something like that that, 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 that says nothing about family structures. That says nothing about the church or churches. Right? That says nothing about, I don't know, workplace institutions or advertising. Or, and they're going to talk about advertising more later, so punt on that one. Um, but the point here, right, is that, that yeah, this, the, the fact that the state usurps onto itself authority or tempts to by usurping the authority of uh of genuine social institutions is not an ideal of liberalism that is that is that is what liberalism is is designed to prevent now if you're going to argue that that the liberal project is doomed to failure because the state once created necessarily will do this that's one thing and that's a that's a really strong argument that's hard to that's hard to deny but to say that this is the liberal project that this was the intention of the liberal project that this is how the this is how liberals envision the state working and idealize the state working that's ridiculous it's absolutely absurd Again, it's taking bits and pieces of, of very different traditions, cobbling them together into one ideology that is really bad for everyone. So again, straw Frankenstein. And so the, the project that has to be to locate, um, locate structures that are minimizing individual autonomy and to expand into them, do away with them, right? Replace them with the state, which is indifferent. So advertising wouldn't be one of them, then, I imagine. Well, okay. Before we get to advertising, the indifferentism of the state, this is actually a really solid criticism that I wish he had expanded upon, because this is a really solid criticism of liberalism as an, ideolo as an ideology, as a uh, sort of ideological framework. And even some of the best liberals sometimes have a problem with this. Um, the idea that um, the, the, the kind of stock criticism goes, I forget who said this, if I can find it, I'll throw it over there or something. 
uh, that a liberal is someone who cannot take their own side in an argument. Right? That an idea that is, I think, actually is key to liberalism is the idea of uh, that we should strive for a kind of um, objective neutrality, especially on the part of the state, right? which is why we have uh, why we have you know religion religious indifferentism, right? both both uh, in sort of legal terms and in social terms. Um, but but the idea that uh, that 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 we we should that ideally what we want to do is we want to we want to just sort of lay out both sides of an argument and not decide which one is correct, which which unfortunately is I, I mean I find it among students right my my students have a really hard time um, articulating a position say in a paper uh, rather than just sort of laying out the alternatives because we're taught to just try and lay out the alternatives and to to consider both sides without actually considering what might be correct, um, whether one side or the other or some combination of the two, right? So, uh, so yeah, there is, a, there is a serious problem that liberalism has with, with indifferentism, uh, with uh, this attempt at neutrality, with viewpoint neutrality or whatever. So that's a real problem. That's, that's a genuine issue that, that he could criticize, but, but doesn't really get into it here. He, he, he says it once and then just kind of moves on. Oh, it depends if you made ask. sense. Yeah, depends if you ask. I mean, I, I, it, it, the problem with advertising is that is it yeah, just, has to do so much with making so much money and then you get different interests involved. But well, just, there is a manipulation upon absolutely. my desires. Right? I, I mean, think if liberals liberal, were consistent, if liberals were consistent, they would, they would, they would go there. Okay. And, and I think le some left liberals probably would. Okay. The problem is, is that liberalism is incoherent. And so there's people... I wonder why it's incoherent. Could it possibly be that you are combining incommensurate and disparate ideas into one ideology that you were calling liberalism? It could be that. Uh, it could be that liberalism had a precise, uh, was a precise school of thought, but has since branched off into sort of different schools of thought, which is basically what happened, right? That that's honestly that, that's 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 kind of what happened with with. It's kind of what happened with almost every school of thought is that somebody had an idea, and then more people had the idea, then they broke off into competing ideas. This is why this is why Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism were different schools of thought in the ancient world rather than just being uh rather than just being socratic socratic thought because socrates taught some stuff and then plato built upon it and then aristotle built upon it in a different direction who would have thought that can happen anyway that again that's why there's kind of an incoherence here um because he is cobbling together an idea from from opposed uh camps from from completely different schools of thought and trains of thought, but advertising, right? People who have a very vested interest in the idea that self-interested contractual relations are always mutually beneficial can't account for advertising as mm -hmm. manipulative. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I. By the way, that's obviously true. Um, mutually okay. Mutually voluntary arena, uh, agreements are are always necessarily at least thought to be mutually beneficial. Both parties, if you are to, if, if, if two people are to agree are to agree to a an exchange, say, we're talking strictly economic terms, or even to agree to any interaction, each party has to at least perceive that they that they stand to benefit. And if person A and person B, if Al and Bob trade if they agree to trade, that necessarily tells us that Al gains from the exchange and that Bob gains from the exchange, or at least they perceive themselves as having gained from the exchange. Now, there, you can, of course, criticize that. You can say that, 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 fine, Al thinks he's gaining from this, but he's incorrect about the matter because he doesn't understand what's going on. Like, there's something about the product that he's buying that, he, that he's misled about, say. Or that Al has his priorities misaligned, right? That that Al is not aiming towards the the highest good, the ultimate good, the that his that his um his incentive structure is misaligned, that sort of thing. Which again, it comes down to a couple of points. One, uh, if you are going to if you're going to criticize Al for his sort of purchasing decisions or his decisions of who to interact with and how, um, that is incredibly um, epistemologically hubristic, you are immediately assuming that you know more about 
what will benefit Al than Al does. And if you know Al very well, and you are a dear friend about, of him, and you care about him greatly, and know a lot about his life, that might be the case. But for most of us, that's not the case. And for anyone who is in charge of public policy, it is necessarily not the case. That information is simply not available to just, you know, bureaucrats, lawmakers, whatever. The other thing is, if Al and Bob trade, and Al knows, or Al does not know that what he's getting is not going to be as good as what he's giving, um, then that's a case of what's called asymmetric information, which, which can lead to um, Al losing on the exchange, say. Um, and that can be his own fault for not knowing, but he, where he could have known, where he could have found out. Uh, or it could be Bob's fault for not telling him or from specifically concealing it. So, for instance, if I go to the store and uh, and I go to buy some, uh, I go to buy some chicken nuggets, right? bag of chicken nuggets from the freezer aisle, great. Um, and I I buy them, I take them home, uh, I go stick them in the air fryer. Uh, they're done. They smell horrible. They're nasty. They're gross. Uh, they're they're like moldy. They're, they're nasty. I don't want them. They're bad. That could be that could be due to all sorts of things. That could be my fault, or for instance, not noticing that say the package was open in the freezer aisle, or not or not noticing that, or maybe it's my fault because I decided to, um, oh hey, these chicken nuggets fell on the floor at some point today. Uh, they fell out of the freezer and you know what, I'm just going to put them in the cart because it's easier than getting one that's still frozen. Okay, so maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's the store's fault. Maybe they left expired product on the shelf. Or maybe uh, maybe an employee um, got it dirty and didn't wash their hands or something. I don't know. All sorts of things could happen, and it could be the store's fault. And the store uh, sort of advertises you know, clean and safe products. And so by advertising that and giving me something other than that, they've committed a kind of fraud, which is why I would be perfectly justified in demanding my money back. And they would give me my money back and there would be no third party involved, right? Because again, it's a reputational thing. So th th there you go. Um, and so in cases where there is a, an exchange that is not mutually beneficial, it is necessarily somehow involuntary and i'm drawing this straight from aquinas again straight from aquinas per aquinas there are two ways in which and a what is ordinarily a voluntary action can be rendered involuntary one by force if you force me to do something i'm not doing it and so it's not a voluntary exchange if you're forcing me to do something if I, if you force me if 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 you force me to pay taxes, I benefit from that not at all. But I choose to do it because otherwise the IRS will come to my door and shoot me and my, and my cats and my family and we'll all die horribly. Right? So it's a threat. It's under threat. Okay. So by force, right? Great. Force or, coer force, force or coercion can render an act involuntary. The other one, which you're forgetting is ignorance. Ignorance can render an act involuntary. If you do not know what it is that you're doing, or you're ignorant of a key factor in your deliberative process, then the action done, the, the outcome, the actual act, rather than the, the intention, is, uh, is involuntary because the action performed does not match with the intention. If I buy a, a bag of frozen chicken nuggets, I intend to buy a bag of frozen chicken nuggets. I don't intend to buy a bag of moldy chicken nuggets. Because I did not know what was in the bag, but I thought I did, my mistaken belief about what's in the bag means that my exchange here was not voluntary. That could be my fault. That could be the store's fault. That could be somebody else's fault. It could be no one's fault in particular. 
The point, though, is that if an exchange is voluntary, it, again, in the, in the strict, straightforward sense of the term, in the very strictly Thomistic sense, if an interaction is voluntary, it is necessarily at least believed to be mutually beneficial by both parties involved, or I should say, by all parties involved. Now, the alternative to this is if I, um, geez, if my ends are misaligned, if I have the wrong ends in mind, like if I'm, if I really should not be eating chicken nuggets because, I don't know, I'm, uh, I have celiac disease and I'm, I'm gluten intolerant, and these are just, you know, regular old bread and chicken nuggets, but man, I love them so much, it's worth, it's worth the, it's worth the, you know, d d irritable bowels or whatever, right? Okay, I've made a poor decision. But I've made a poor decision. Right? It's not like I have been defrauded or anything. Right? Sure, a mutual exchange cannot, can be non-mutually beneficial. If one or more parties has uh, is is pursuing the wrong end, but but that's just again that's an that's a, that's a particular individual ethical matter rather than a uh, sort of political or even a social matter. So okay, now advertising, right, they can't admit that it's manipulative. You see, because it's free. I mean, it's a it's a free exchange. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, like like yeah. so they can't they can't admit. Um, and this is one of the reasons where I quit becoming a, being a libertarian in college is so I asked my professors about advertising because and what they told me was, well, advertising is the way that people communicate to each other what's for sale. And it's like, that's not what advertising is at all. Right? Advertising isn't just like a list of the specifications. No, advertising. Um, I don't know who said that, but that's embarrassing. Because that's not what that's not what advertising is. I mean, it is that, but it's also it's also a rhetorical attempt to to convince you. Uh, that something is worth buying. It's, it's manipulative in the same sense that a convincing argument is manipulative. Is instilling a desire within you that but you didn't that wasn't have there previously. Before. <laughs> right. But see, that, 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 so why? Well, Jesus Christ, I do that all the time. Like, ev we all do that all the time. We all instill in other people desires that they did not have before. For example, I... Here we go. Um, when I, uh, when I, so my students last week handed in proposals for their papers, and I gave them comments and feedback on them. I said, "Hey, um, here's how you should fix your thesis. Here's how, here's some other sources you could look into. Here's uh, here's some additional points to consider. Yada yada yada. The whole ordinary feedback sort of thing. By doing so, I instilled in them desires that they did not previously have." such as the desire to refine their thesis, the desire to look into these additional sources, the desire to correct this mistaken argument, so that it aligns with the desires that they did already have. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That is simply and straightforwardly human interaction. Hell, that is what that is what is going on. Even if you just say, "Here are the specific product specifications." If an advertisement were simply, you know, this washing machine can take X many uh, so many pounds of clothes using so much so many gallons of water using this much power, and it's uh, it's uh, it is this internal volume, et cetera, et cetera. If it were simply product specifications, even that, independent of whether you're going to buy it or not is instilling in you a desire that you did not previously have. It is instilling in you the desire to, to believe these true statements as true. If I say something true to you, you now gain a new desire to know those things, to believe those things because you now know that they're true. You, truth statements are, because truth statements are normative, even truth statements do this. Anything that you ever say to anyone is instilling in them something that they did not other, are, other already have otherwise. It's, this is, this is assuming this, if you take this, okay, if you take this line of reasoning to its logical extreme, this would, this would force you to conclude that all human interaction is exploitative, which is insane. 
uh, advertising is instilling a desire within you that you that didn't wasn't have there previously. Before. <laughs> right. But see that that that. So why is that not fraud? Right. What's the if it isn't false? Okay. That's the key. That's why we have this category of false advertising. Right. If I advertise something, and my the implication of my advertisement is that it will produce this particular good result or whatever, and it won't do that. That's false advertising. If I say that, <laughs> if I say that my classes, that uh, that a degree from this university will will uh, allow you to make such and such amount of money because of your degree, that might not actually be true. In fact, it's probably not right. So, but if my my sort of advertisement for my class is that. Uh, is that this is a this is a key component of of a liberal education, and, and as such, this liberal education, this idea of of forming yourself according to uh, according to perennial values and understanding yourself and the world you live in, this is an intrinsic. This is something that is intrinsically intrinsically valuable to you. This is the education due to a citizen, due to a free person, due to a uh, due to a human being as such, and that's why you should absolutely. Pursue a liberal education, pursue a philosophical education. That's advertising. That's not false. Right? Th that's the distinction. That's why it's not fraud. Sure, it's manipulative, but it's manipulative in the sense that any rhetorical uh, statement is manipulative. Which is to say that it it's it is, but we're okay with it. Univers we're universally okay with that. The what's the difference between between advertising and fraud if fraud is lying you know in manipulation through lying right um is advertising manipulation through lying if it is it's false advertising that's the again that's the key takeaway i mean, I mean this should be painfully obvious huh. these things i think i think that the they can't account for it um the liberal the, the free marketeer liberals can't account for it um so they have to just kind of pretend like it doesn't exist well to give me an right. example you're talking about the ubiquity of government right yeah and we're talking about okay so liberalism is about the autonomy of the individual being maximized right and so the is that right i mean yes yes ideologically and I, so I, I hesitate because i don't think that's what a lot of liberals are actually doing but that's that's but that's philosophically what they, but that's, that's what they yes. want right they want yeah. i mean that's fair i mean a lot of modern liberals progressives that 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 sort of strain of liberalism are not trying to do that at all but fair enough every individual to reach their yeah, uh, yeah that's, right. that's what they say. Okay, and <laughs> and, so, and it sounds like we're saying that then the only kind of immoral thing would be to squelch another person's autonomy, though we have no good. That's that again does not follow for reasons we've already gone through. Uh, this is this is another point where where again I, I wish he would push back on this because there's this if if autonomy, even understood in this way, is the sole political goal. If personal autonomy is the political goal of the liberal project. That is not to say that it is the only ethical norm. Reason for making that claim. That's right. So what happened? But it's not against the rules to, to, to suppress someone else's aggressive action against you. Right? That was the yeah. founding of the state to begin with. So if we expand our understanding of aggressive action. To it is if you're doing it not through the state. Now, this is actually a really solid criticism of the sort of classical liberal night watchman state, uh, which anarchists make like anarcho capitalists the more consistent liberals uh will make is that that self-defense if if we if we invest the state with our individual right to self-defense if we collectivize that individual right to self-defense in the institution of the state what that what that can be interpreted as interpreted as meaning is that that i have i have relinquished my own right to defend myself and i have relinquish that right to somebody else to defend me and you actually find this in like in modern society that self-defense is in large part not acceptable or it is only acceptable upon the permission of the state um which is why after you defend yourself uh, or you defend your property you should you are sort of legally required to do things like call the police and file a police report and do all that kind of stuff um even though what you were doing is just asserting your own natural rights to your own person property etc uh, so yeah there is a there is a real concern here that uh, that 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 by extending our right of self-defense to the state to this coercive institution to this coercive monopolistic institution it it, it exercises that monopoly power over us and not just over uh, over us 
even for the things that we ought to be able to naturally do. Uh, and so, so this is this is why we can't form sort of mutual defense pacts, um, or or the state will call us a militia and we'll you know shoot our dogs and burn us alive kind of thing. Um, that is precisely the problem that uh, that the anarchists will point out with the sort of Lockean uh, Night Watchman State approach to to move from um, mm. like actually physically invading the property to saying psychologically abusing you. OK, mm. um, which is what a liberal would think, say, religion is, yep. right, is, is psychologically. Depends on the liberal, obviously. Again, this is he's doing the thing again. I don't need to say it. He's doing the thing. That's what Richard Dawkins called okay. child abuse. Um, then the expansion into that realm is is a mm. continuation of the same the same philosophy that led to this establishment of the police force to begin with. OK, so so the, this is the reason why liberals look at the world and where they see non-political power structures, they see mm. oppression. Oh. They see the pe patriarchy. So this is, uh, so yeah, patriarchy, this is, um, this is, uh, the, there is a group of, they call themselves left libertarians, the libertarian left. It's that, uh, that bottom left quadrant of the, the, the sort of typical political chart, which is not liberal or libertarian really at all. Um, they're coercive statists. It's just that they think that the state should coerce people not to, not to impose on one another in the way that he's talking about. Okay. Uh, this is, this is a, there's a notorious, an absolutely notorious article um, in libertarian circles um, by a, uh, by an activist and uh, sex worker. Um, I think, I don't know if she currently still is, but she was at some point um, called uh, shaming is unjustifiable coercion, uh, which is attempting to, to argue that these uh, these institutional power structures or, or structures of authority rather um, are coercive in the same way that the state is coercive, and so uh, so the state is justified in 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 acting against things like the patriarchy, that sort of thing. I, I again I can see the problem he's pointing to, but that problem is antithetical to the liberal project, or at least antithetical to large parts of the liberal project, because the liberal project is so unbelievably diverse, because it is branched out into so many various different ideologies, some of which are aberrations of the original ideas, some of which are developments of the original ideas, some of which are, are parallel developments. Again, you can't you can criticize some of these elements. In some cases, in some contexts, sure. Trying to criticize them all at once, as if this was some monolithic ideology, is batty. Patriarchy. They see um, moral it, codes. They see wherever there's wherever there's authority, uh -huh. right? That has power. Yeah. That's, we can we can separate these. Um, I have a I have a what I think is actually a pretty good, very good, um, popular level. Uh, article distinguishing power from authority that we always necessarily should do we should always distinguish and separate power from authority um at least conceptually um authority is uh is best thought of in the analogy of uh, of intellectual authority uh, authority is the ability to get things right consistently uh, authority says that you ought to listen to me power is the ability to impose one's will on someone else is the ability to say you will listen to me uh, right, so authority says you should listen to me. Power says you will. Typically, ideally, these flow together. Authority has power to back it up. However, you can argue, and I have argued elsewhere as well, that the exercise of power, because it is necessarily coercive, uh, unless that power is exercised let's say defensively, right, in, in, in the protection of uh, the, uh, oneself or others who want you to protect them, um, that, that, is, uh, that, that illegitimates one's authority. Right? So power can even undermine authority. The exercise of power can undermine authority, especially the non-authoritative use of power. Right? And, and that's almost always what you see, like historically, that the that authority figures will exercise power and then will exercise too much power and that will undermine their authority and then that's when they collapse right that that's the the sort of path of the tyrant whether that's the petty tyrant or whether that's the real significant political tyrant that's not the state they see oppression 
I guess they would say unless those being oppressed are willingly oppressed, in which case they're not oppressed and we should leave them alone. Isn't that yeah, the well, then, then, then it's, I mean, when you say willingly oppressed, you have <laughs> immense... Well, I mean, they're not willing. If they're willingly oppressed, that's a contradiction. They're yeah. not oppressed. But if yeah, like, a child mean, I... wishes to be fathered, then presumably the liberal would say, well, just leave him alone. Like, let everyone do their thing. Yes. I mean, that, that, I, some people would say that. Um, the problem is, with, with liberalism is that it develops a, um, it develops, there develops a sort of elitism in it where the people who are in, who are currently being oppressed are not in a position to see their own uh -huh. oppression. Yeah. So you, right? you have to see it for them. But we see it for them. And so we're going to free them. So, so the March. That's, that's, again, that's just Marxism. That's Marxist vanguardism. Now, if you want, and, and of course, neo-Marxists have the same thing with respect to, you know, feminism, with respect to critical theory, with respect to racialism, with respect to queer theory, all of these stuff, all these neo-Marxist doctrines have the same thing. But this is Marxist. This is not liberal. And he already earlier made the distinction between liberalism and Marxism. Now, if you want to say that Marxism is just a strain of liberalism, which is fair, you can make that argument that Marxism did develop out of liberalism then fine, but then don't go trying to, don't go trying to separate them sometimes and then conflate them at others. Such a progress. That's then. interesting. I think of BLM here because I have <laughs> several close black friends who would say, I don't see the oppression that you're telling me that I'm experiencing right. BLM. And yeah. BLM is saying, well, we see it for you and they're going to make yeah. sure you see it sort of thing. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's right. So, so, so the, the experience <laughs> of progress is this march of identifying and eliminating um, non-political, non-state based power structures. Hmm. Right. Okay. And this... Um, I mean, this the liberal progress. The liberal progress is to the liberal progress is to eliminate non-state power structures. That's good lord. Okay. Um. I. I. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to see the absolute contrary to this point, uh, look to Hans Hermann Hoppe once again. Now, maybe you can argue that he is an anarcho-capitalist, but not a liberal. Maybe he's an anti-liberal anarchist. But all of the sort of trad cons that I ever try and uh, I, I ever try and you know show something to by Hoppe uh, will usually just say, "Well, he's just a liberal," or "No, he's like I'm going to listen to somebody who's a liberal," or or or. Uh, or they'll get out the double parentheses or the triple parentheses or whatever, um, because usually a lot of his stuff is hosted on Mises.org. And, and, you know, Mises was was one of those one of those, you know. Again, this is anecdotal. This isn't to say that. To be clear, I am in no way accusing I'm in no way accusing uh, Dr. Jones uh, or Matt Fratt of anything approaching anti-Semitism. I'm just saying that a lot of that there are people of. Uh, there are people who I try to show Hoppe, uh, and where he where he will argue that these mediating institutions, uh, these these institutions within society that are not the state but still have this these structures of authority, that this is essential to opposing the state, and that the state is the institution of uh, contrary to our autonomy and contrary to our freedom and contrary to our flourishing. Uh, that are that are just very quick to dismiss him. Um, some of them, some of them just due to anti-Semitism, but, but more seriously, some of them are just quick to dismiss Hoppe because he's part of the, what they see at least as the liberal tradition. And I mean, if that's true, then what we have here is completely antithetical to at least that part of the liberal tradition, because Hoppe holds that these mediating institutions of authority are absolutely legitimate and are protections against the tyranny of the state. Now, if you want to say that Hoppe is a kind of anti-liberal anarchist, I'm kind of open to that possibility. Because he does draw a lot from, uh, from pre-liberal thinkers. And he does hold things like that the medieval, um, feudal, roughly speaking, feudal, um, pre-absolutist pre monarchy social structure was far preferable to the modern nation state for various reasons that are really solid having to do with like layers of authority and things like that. Okay. I mean, if you want to say that he's a kind of anti-liberal anarcho-capitalist, then okay, fine, cool. But that just means that anarcho-capitalism is not necessarily liberalism. And so liberalism it gets even more weird caveats and idiosyncrasies. So maybe, maybe it is self-contradictory, but maybe that's just because it's such a diverse set of schools of thought. This is the reason why the liberal holds in great suspicion 
things like patriotism, um, love of family, love of town, love of whatever. I mean, like any, any, these are very different things because patriotism is at least in the modern nation state, certainly in somewhere like the U S uh, which is an ideological nation. I mean, it's, a, it's a creedal nation, so to speak, not creedal. That's not the right, that's not the right word. Uh, ideological nation, I guess you'd call it. Um, propositional nation something like that um it is unified first and foremost by the state right there, there's almost no other sense in which the united states as a whole is a nation there is a people uh other than the patriotism which is sort of kept under the umbrella of the state and so to say that the the patriotism is suspe is is under suspicion by liberals it kind of gives away the game at least I think um, that that again that the liberal project is sort of the project of the nation state. Um, maybe that's maybe that's true. Maybe we do have to reject liberalism in order to reject the liberal the liberal nation state. And so maybe the maybe the anarchist, the most consistent liberal, is the the discarding of liberalism and maybe liberalism is self-defeating in this way but that's not like a, like i said that's not the argument he's making that's a good one but that's not what he's saying any sort of pre-contractual pre-rational um affection or what does he mean by pre-contractual so again if he means pre-contractual meaning pre-rational explicit agreement with uh with a uh with a you know an enforceable uh with an enforcement clause right then sure, plenty of our relationships are pre-contractual in that sense. But in that case, it's not in any way dichotomized with coercive, with coercive, coercive, or with uh, hegemonic. That's so very clearly that is not at all what almost anyone in the liberal tradition, aside from again from the, the sort of existentialist strain and aside from the Hobbesians, that that's not what they mean by contractual. Like, because he's drawing that language, if I'm not mistaken, from Mises, that's not what Mises meant by contractual. Mises meant voluntary. And so familial relationships are voluntary. Um, it, all of these social relationships that are not mediated through the state are voluntary. And so they are contractual in that sense. There is, there is no sense in saying this, that a relationship is pre-contractual. Yes, it can be a natural relationship, but we maintain that relationship through voluntary, uh, voluntary human interaction. And we ought to maintain that relationship because it is a natural relationship and it is conducive to our flourishing and all that. But that goes beyond the merely political, um, merely political goals of liberalism in the sense that we've been talking about. Or devotion that is that is somehow in potential conflict with the hegemony of the disinterested ubiquitous state hmm. is almost certainly oppressive right and so and so a target maybe we haven't gotten around yet to eliminating that but we will and that's the march of progress wow hey thank you so much for watching before you go do us a favor leave a comment let us know what you thought of the video like comment subscribe do that stuff for for, for me and then also for pints with aquinas because i will say pints with aquinas is fantastic it's a great channel um Despite these disagreements that I've had here, uh, I, I will say that that uh, Pines of Aquinas, Aquinas is fantastic. There's always great material there. He has fantastic interviews. He has the well-earned reputation as the Catholic Joe Rogan. Um, but man, like I said, I think that uh, I could summarize the problem as being that he, uh, Dr. Jones here, right? He, he, he has this straw Frankenstein version of liberalism where he takes aspects of so many different strains of liberal thought and tries to weave them into one coherent ideology that he wants to criticize and he winds up making this this bizarre nightmare scenario that that even i would ha i would probably go so far as to say any particular liberal would severely object to because it involves aspects of ideologies that are contrary to their own even if they're within the broad general liberal tradition so again, I don't think he's criticizing here what is at, at the root of liberalism. Uh, and I don't think that he's criticizing any particular view, even really. Uh, and I think that, again, that's the that's the that's the biggest problem with a lot of these sorts of things. That and and I will say, the implicit assumption that that the science of economics is is simply ideological and the sort of dismissal of those ideas. 
Um, and and that's where you get this sort of preference for, for maybe Belloc's kind of distributism sort of thing with a lot of uh, a lot of more traditional, more traditionally minded Catholics who who go into um, sort of anti market right wing politics that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, again, that that's a separate concern for what Dr. Chen's talking about. That might be for for another uh, another discussion. We'll see. But for now, um, this was uh, we've had we've done another one. I've done another one of these response videos. I have a good time doing these. Uh, if you've got anything else that uh, any of these other videos that you'd like me to respond to, like me to pick apart, like me to criticize, like me to like me to expand upon anything like that. Um, it's only been what an hour and 40 minutes uh, for a 12 minute video. I think I can afford to do a few more of these. So if you find more of them that you'd like to see me do, uh, let me know. Uh, if you're not in the discord already where you can tell me to do that, join right down below. Uh, follow me on the, the regular social media stuff. Uh, and if you like what I'm doing and want to see me continue doing what I'm doing, feel free to donate down to ko-fi.com slash Professor McCoy. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all of those wonderful YouTube stuff. And I'll see you next time. Bye.